Welcome to the 31st episode of Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. I'm welcoming storyteller guest Kathleen Knowles. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Liz. So you're going to be doing two readings for us this evening. Um, Can you start by telling me about the first one? Okay. Uh, This is uh, a love story. Uh, The two characters in it are Sylvia and Jules. It takes place in the spring and summer and fall of 2008, uh, and the location is San Francisco. And uh, Sylvia is a uh, marriage equality volunteer, and they have uh, met by chance. And Jules, well, to say the least, is fairly well smitten with, with Sylvia, but for reasons that I go into in the book, Sylvia isn't actually reciprocating anything. So they're trying to be friends in that time-honored lesbian fashion. <laughs> and after uh, a, a day at a, an event called Cinco de Mayo, uh, which is like the, the Mexican festival, Jules has invited Sylvia home and she's going to cook dinner for her. But first they have to go shopping. So they're at a uh, 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 natural food store in the Mission in San Francisco. They walked first to the bulk bins. Sylvia was unaware so many varieties of rice or flour or even beans existed. She looked through the various goods with interest while Jules was efficiently filling small envelopes of spices and scooping out a bag of brown rice and writing their numbers. A stern sign advised them, no grazing in the bulk bins. Sylvia could easily see childish fingers covered with snot pawing through the trail mix. Around the corner from the bulk bin, Sylvia found herself in front of gigantic barrels of peanut butter, apple butter, and almond butter, over which stood a shelf holding metal containers of at least six varieties of honey. The sheer quantity of food stopped her cold. She was staring and didn't notice Jules come to her side until she heard Jules' voice in her right ear. How about some organic peanut butter and jelly for dinner, Jules asked in a low voice, crunchy or smooth. To Sylvia, Jules seemed to be somehow talking about something else. The way she said smooth gave her goosebumps and put the thought of smooth skin into her mind. She was afraid to turn, but she responded, pitching her voice just as low as Jules had, smooth, always smooth for me. She dared to turn and look then, but Jules appeared innocent. Ah, good. Fortunately, we were having gumbo, a variation on that old vegetarian standby rice and beans. Jules tilted her head in a self-deprecating way, obviously apologizing for being vegetarian. Well, rice and beans are certainly familiar to me, Sylvia let her tone indicate that she was teasing. I'll try to make it at least a little exotic. I look forward to it, Sylvia said, and she meant it. It meant something for someone to cook for you. It was an act of love. She had certainly learned that at her mother's side in the kitchen, and she hadn't consciously thought of it while making breakfast that morning for Jules, but her mind now put that together. We're just being nice, she told herself. It's what friends do for one another. At the produce bin, Sylvia could see more clearly the makeup of Rainbow's customers. They were mostly young hipster Anglos, tattooed, dreadlocked, and pierced. The good number of Latinos, however, surprised her somewhat, but maybe it was merely their neighborhood store. She also saw trendy young Latinos, the intersection of the two groups. They all looked quite serious, carrying their cloth shopping bags and talking about varieties of kumquats with their companions. Sylvia started to develop a little attitude. Rainbow's customers seemed just a teeny bit self-righteous about their choices. They were, at least, the Anglo ones, probably vegan or vegetarian, and they refused to patronize the nasty, price-gouging, corporate, non-organic, environment-raping supermarket. They were far too involved. Come on, I want to show you something. It's my favorite part of the store. Jules touched her elbow to steer her. Sylvia's annoyance at Rainbow's customers ebbed in the face of Jules' enthusiasm. Near the center of Rainbow were several aisles devoted to vitamins, supplements, minerals, amino acids, herbals, homeopathic meds, protein powders, and the like. Sylvia had never seen such an array. A rack held information sheets and scattered about the aisles. Comparably hip-looking Rainbow staff held detailed technical discussions on the various items with the patrons. Holy shit, that was all she could think of to say. Jules grinned. 
I know it's all much too much, but I love it. I have to watch out in this area, or I'll want to buy everything. As they stood in a long line to check out, Sylvia couldn't resist saying, "This place is holier than thou to the max." That it is, but it's really a pretty good place to shop price-wise, and the selection is phenomenal. It beats Whole Foods. You know what they call Whole Foods. Oh, I understand. Latinos shop here, and they're cheap. No, what do they call Whole Foods? Whole paycheck. They looked at each other and giggled. I should probably add that Sylvia is Latino and Jules is a vegetarian, and there's a constant uh, strain through the whole book about the uh, vice versa and and back and forth between vegetarian or omnivore mm-hmm. type people. So that's the end of the first reading. Hmm. I kind of I find that interesting, as you know, especially the comment about Whole Foods. Mm-hmm. I find the place obscenely expensive. It, it 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 mostly is, although sometimes they have sales that are okay. Well, I mean, I but the the latter part of the sentence is I find it fascinating. <laughs> you know, they've got great cuts of like for those who are omnivores. Mm-hmm. Um, they have great fish and meat and a lot of different choices, which are great. But at the same time, goodness gracious, you know. Yes. The, <laughs> but you want to have all those magical, wonderful, miraculous things. Mm-hmm. But I think I'd like to go to the shop that you've described more. It's a great it's a great place. It obviously doesn't sell any animal protein, but it's it's a terrific place, really. No, I I you know, I I love it, you know, conceptually. I like that kind of food. Mm-hmm. It means I I would, I'd like, you know, I don't know that I'd know how to precisely use all the wonderful different things that were in there, but I'd be more than happy to have somebody cook for me from there. Yep. Um so can you give me a little bit of lead up into this second Part of the reading. Sure. Uh, the two characters, uh, Jules and Sylvia, well, they're still in the mode of, of being friends, but Sylvia has invited Jules to come to uh, a very important political event uh, on May 15th, and it was the day that the California Supreme Court actually started marriage equality in California. Mm-hmm. So they're having this huge event at the LGBT Center, and Jules has come down to meet Sylvia and her friends at this event. Okay. Jules started to thread her way through the mob. Fortunately, many people seemed to be milling around outside, scanning the street or talking into their phones, sharing their excitement. She got into the main lobby space, but it was far more crowded near the front. She looked over the crowd, but she couldn't find Sylvia in the throng. As she pushed her way as politely as she could toward the stage, she spotted Sylvia with Perla at her side. Facing slightly away, she was saying something to Perla. She was wearing blue jeans and a red tank top with a short shirt tied around her waist. Her hair was down, but it looked a little disordered. As Jules got closer, she saw that Sylvia was a bit flushed from the heat, which gave her light brown skin a nice glow. She looked incredibly beautiful and infinitely desirable. Desire welled up and she struggled to quash it. When she tapped Sylvia gently on the shoulder, she spun around startled, then recognized Jules and threw her arms around her. Jules held onto her, conscious of both her own body heat and Sylvia's, and a jolt of arousal seared through her, stronger than any she'd ever felt. Hi, I didn't mean to startle you. Jules was holding on and practically whispering into Sylvia's ear. Sylvia said, oh, I don't know how long, I didn't know how long it would take you, and I couldn't keep twisting around. She leaned back a little in Jules' arms so they could make eye contact, and Jules tried to keep it together under an onslaught of emotions, happiness, anxiety, and sexual arousal. Hot and getting hotter, she couldn't read the expression that remained on Sylvia's face after her initial surprise drained away, and Sylvia gently disengaged from their embrace. I'm glad we found each other. Perla and everyone are all here. Perla, Hannah, and Elspeth greeted Jules with exuberant hugs. She returned them happily, but kept her attention on Sylvia, who was focused on the stage. Jules wasn't disappointed because it gave her the opportunity to scrutinize Sylvia a little more. 
Her skin was misted with sweat, as Jules had noticed during their all-too-brief hug, and she was practically vibrating from excitement. Jules was nearly speechless with desire, and she was afraid she might pant like a dog and drool soon. She caught Sylvia's excitement as well as the emotions emanating from the crowd. She'd been to the Pride Parade several times, and it felt somewhat like that, but more so. Something momentous was occurring, and she was being pulled into it by Sylvia's reaction. She was content to watch as Sylvia rocked on her heels, chatted with Perla or Hannah, or grinned happily with anyone who'd caught her eye. Jules recognized the man from the Equality California meeting she'd attended a few weeks before as he walked onto the stage. The people in the crowd started to focus on him and their conversations moderated. He tapped the microphone and said, testing, which reverberated over their heads and managed to get almost everyone's attention. Hello, his amplified voice boomed. I'm Mark Mahan from Equality California. Is this a great day or what? The crowd screamed, roared, whistled, and clapped. In case anyone here did not get the news, today the Supreme Court of California affirmed that denying marriage to LGBT people is unconstitutional. More noise. Jules fixed her gaze on Sylvia as she hung on every one of Mark's words and waved her arms. It was a remarkable transformation. Jules had long suspected a deep vein of passion lay inside Sylvia that she took care to hide under a matter-of-fact facade, and here was the proof. Jules had worked hard to quell her attraction to Sylvia, both for her own sanity and so she couldn't damage their budding friendship, and she'd been mostly successful. But her resolve was cracking. They were both caught up in the emotions of the moment, and even the uncharacteristic warmth of the evening was impelling Jules toward doing something she might regret, but that she wouldn't ultimately be able to prevent. They were standing close together and were pressed even closer by the crowd surrounding them. Jules was intensely conscious of their nearness. She was certain invisible sexual signals were passing between their two bodies. Mark continued his speech, but Jules could no longer hear him because she was too focused on Sylvia. She realized that another person had taken the microphone, though, one of the attorneys on the case. She spoke for a few minutes, and Sylvia listened raptly. Jules wished Sylvia would direct that adoration toward her. The crowd seemed equally taken by her, if their dedicated attention was any indication. Then a representative from the San Francisco County Clerk's Office rose to explain that weddings could begin on the 1st of June. Finally, Mark came back and said, I'm now thrilled to introduce you to the mayor of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom. The response of the crowd was deafening, and during all that noise, Sylvia turned her radiant smile on Jules. Jules stopped thinking rationally and gave in to the irresistible urge and kissed her. Sylvia kissed her back with equal fervor for a few incandescent seconds before she drew away with an unreadable expression and returned her attention to the speakers. Jules was breathing heavily both from desire and astonishment at her temerity. She looked around guiltily, wondering if any of Sylvia's friends had seen them and deciding she didn't care one way or another. She only cared what Sylvia was thinking. This wasn't the time for discussion, though. And chastened, Jules paid attention to the event and the speakers, although she kept looking at Sylvia out of the corner of her eye. Most of the speeches ran together for Jules until near the end when they caught her attention because the mood of the crowd changed so radically. As did Sylvia's attitude. She'd gone from ecstatically happy to serious in a moment. The current speaker was telling the now somber crowd that a group of right-wing religious fanatics had turned in over a million signatures to the Secretary of State, of State of California to amend the California Constitution to take away their newly won right to marry. The people were muttering and cursing now, and the speaker cautioned them, we don't know if it will qualify because it takes a while for them to check that many signatures. Even if it does qualify for the November election, we'll fight it and we can win. At this statement, the crowd noise took on a different, belligerent tone filled with angry mutterings. The rally broke up soon thereafter, and Jules accompanied Sylvia and her friends up Market Street as they discussed dinner plans. That's the end. Whew. What an emotional moment. 
Yes. For yes. both, <laughs> you know. <Work> reasons. <laughs> yeah. No, and and I I like the way it it played in balance with what was going on around them, mm-hmm. and I also like the pacing where the interaction between the two of them, where they actually do kiss, um, has enough time between that ending and the bad news. So. <laughs> You know, it has that, you know, kind of magical moment. And then, you know, she's trying to keep it together after doing something she told herself she would not do. And then it brings that, God, what that must have felt like, I have no idea. Talk about um, political whiplash. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I have to say... Um, I, I joke that I'm civil unionized. Actually, that's why I'm in Colonial Williamsburg right now. Uh, we're celebrating our third anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we live in New Jersey uh, where you can get married. They just changed things so that you can get properly married in our state. And yep. it's happening like wildfire all over the country. Mm-hmm. And... I'm shocked because, like, I don't know if it's just inherent pessimism on my part. (laughs) But I, you know, for the longest, because, you know, we've been together almost nine years. um, I was like, you know what? I'd rather wait for marriage equality, you know. And when that happens, we'll do this. Otherwise, it's, you know, whatever. Uh Not not to negate anybody's commitment ceremony, because those are awesome and beautiful and wonderful. But I figured if I was going to get married I wanted to get married <laughs> not right. I didn't want to get civil unionized <laughs> you know I wanted to get married mm-hmm. um, but after three years of being engaged her my mother-in-law and um, <laughs> my, you know my soon-to-be uh, sister-in-law cousin um, were like um, what's going on here <laughs> so we finally we finally planned our wedding and had it and, and whatnot and so um, I'm from the East Coast, so listening to how that must have felt, like I, I felt like I was in that historical moment. So that was very well written. I appreciate you sharing it on the show. Thank you. Um, it was, uh, I was, of course, I was here in San Francisco at, at the time, and it, it, it was a, just a roller coaster ride from sort of the beginning of, of the year through the court trial and then the decision was announced on May 15th and it was a really hot day. It was in the 90s and that's highly unusual for for San Francisco and so that sort of... What month was it again? May. It was May 15th okay. when it was announced and so at that that particular day and that particular night it was really warm so that's I used that part to uh, that weather fact to to uh, uh, be part of the scene that, mm-hmm. where they're at the uh, at, at the meeting at the rally after the announcement of the uh, of the, the court decision so yeah I, I um I I lived in this well I, I didn't live there very long but I was in, I lived in the area for a little over a month um, in Santa Rosa, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, Sebastopol, which is like an hour north. Mm-hmm. But my recollections weather-wise, because I visited there in the winter too, and whew, very different. Um, but it, when I was there, it was August and September, and I remember during the day it being like sweltering. And the second that the sun went down, it was freezing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is not how weather works here <laughs> you know no. if if it if it's if it's hot during the day i mean there there can be a drop off but not that extreme and i was just like Ugh. so i can imagine you know on a spring night being warm still that must be something it feels really weird to have that happen in 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 san francisco because usually it it becomes foggy and windy and, and cold as soon as late afternoon rolls around. So that made it an extremely un, un, unusual day uh, in, a, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways. So, yes, the whole trip between the court decision and then finding out about Prop, uh, that Prop 8 was going to be on the ballot and then the constant news stories and polls and on and on and on and on and just 
people were talking. That's all people talked. At least all the people I knew. That's all they were, 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 were talking were, about at the were, time. We're talking about and and I was giving them money and uh, obsessively listening to news reports or reading new news reports every day. And then the election happened. Mm-hmm. And of course, that was you know when uh, President Obama was elected president for the first time. So. Anyway, that's the that's in the book as uh, uh, as well. So I I wanted to use the context of sort of political passion uh, mm-hmm. that that transmutes itself into romantic passion. So well, you know, it it's not always like the twain meet quite often. You know, mm-hmm. I I went to Mount Holyoke, which is a women's college. Oh yes, <laughs> and so I am more than aware of like how passions run really high. I was a political science major too, mm-hmm. especially my women's studies classes. So I, I can imagine, you know, all the emotion of that momentous um, experience. And so I'm. I, I think it's a really important moment to capture in a novel. Speaking of, is this something that my listeners can buy now? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is on sale right now. Uh, we like to have you buy it direct from Bold Strokes, but it is available online uh, in Am- at Amazon.com. And I suppose I should mention the name of it. It's called Forsaking All Others. Mm-hmm. So, forsaking all others, and you know, I do make a point of promoting publish, uh, buying things from the publisher well, website. And one of the reasons for it is that more money goes into the pockets of us wonderful LGBT community members, including authors, editors, and publishers, than than what would happen on other websites. So, if you're going to e buy, buy on the publisher website. And I'm very happy to have had you as a guest on the show, Kathleen, and I am looking forward to reading this novel. It sounds really up my alley. Well, thanks very much for having me, Liz, and it was a lot of fun to uh, read on your show. (laughs) I loved listening, so we're, we're a good pair.